Thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar about SB 91, which extends the eviction moratorium through the end of June and provides resources for landlords and tenants. Uh, if you've been following the news, the first early urgent action item we took in the state legislature was to protect our tenants and landlords uh, and small landlords. And that took the form of Senate Bill 91. What that does is extends the eviction moratorium saying you cannot be evicted during the pandemic uh, until June 30th of 2021. And it also passed $2.6 billion in rental, direct rental assistance. Um, I'm pleased to represent the, the 25th Assembly District. And uh, I have the privilege of representing two counties, Alameda and Santa Clara County, as well as the cities of Fremont, Newark, Santa Clara, Milpitas, and San Jose. Uh, I'm pleased also to be joined today by San Jose City Council Member Magdalena Carrasco, Lauren Cardin from the Law Foundation, and Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, Emily. Emily Hislop from Project Sentinel, and David Lowe from Destination Home, who will go more into about how um, you directly access this, uh, directly access the rental assistance that uh, the state of California is providing. Um, while we're lucky that California has an eviction moratorium in place, a lot of the back rent that is owed has been piling up for almost a whole over a year. We're about at the year mark of the entire pandemic and uh, Notably so, a lot of Californians are hurting. So that's why we're putting on this webinar today to talk about the emergency rental system programs. Uh, our presenters are gonna go more into detail about what the program means for you and what assistance is available and how you can, and how you can access it. So um, with that though, I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Carrasco, who's joining us on the road. Hi, Magdalena. Hi there. Hi, thank you so much, Assembly Member. Well, my name is Magdalena Carrasco, and it's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to co-host this uh, very important uh, session. Uh, you know, uh, over the last several uh, months, actually, uh, especially during the pandemic, one of our biggest goals has been to make sure to protect our residents. Uh, this has been such such a difficult time for for our folks. We've never seen anything like what we're experiencing. Uh, uh, during the pandemic. And of course, when I, when we got into office, at least when I got into office, I never in my life imagined that we'd be dealing with one of the worst uh, health crises of our time and making sure that people are safe, making sure that people feel secure, making sure that people uh, are uh, not in fear of losing their home or, or, uh, or, or worse yet, that their children are in danger of being out on the street is one of the the, the biggest goals that we have, and my team has been working uh, you know, day and night to make sure that that happens. So it's truly my pleasure to be here and to be able to get the resources out there to folks who truly, truly need it. Uh, so thank you so much, Assembly Member. I know that you've been out there uh, working as well to make sure that the information and the resources get to your residents. And I know that you've been, you've been in office for uh, just a few months, but uh, with the pandemic, a lot of challenges are posed and uh, and I know that you've had to hit the ground running as, uh, as you're taking on your new responsibilities. And uh, it's also a, a, you know, a real pleasure to be able to be here with the Law Foundation. Um, uh, and I don't know if I just lost a uh, signal or no, not. No, but you're still here. You're still here. Yeah, to be there with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, Project Sentinel. Uh, sorry, I'm on an uh, uh, interesting device here. Uh, housing, uh, uh, Project Sentinel housing is, is uh, again, key to everybody who, who really is struggling here in the Valley. And, uh, you know, the, hopefully the, our, our residents who are listening have, uh, have many questions for us and, and the right people are at the table to answer those questions and be able to provide the resources uh, necessary. My team is also on the line. And, uh, and of course, we're always available here for whatever people need, whether it's uh, housing insecurities or food insecurities, truly we're available to whatever, um, whatever other issues come up. So uh, what I wanna make sure that people understand is that regardless of whether we're here for over the next hour or not, uh, we're here available to you. We wanna make sure that people truly understand that and uh, regardless of what the issue is, especially during a pandemic, this is a very unusual time for everybody. Zoom is not the only way that you can get a hold of us. Uh, I want to make sure that people understand you can get a hold of us anytime and, and for any other reason. Uh, make sure that you feel comfortable to reach out to us. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Council Member Carrasco. And I want to thank you also for your tireless advocacy, especially for Eastside residents, Eastside San Jose residents, uh, who often are overlooked in our, in our greater pandemic response efforts. And I'm really happy to be partnering with you to make sure our underserved are not overlooked and not neglected during this pandemic response. So um, that's obviously a different subject for another time, but right now we're gonna focus on how do we get direct relief to, into people's hands while we make sure we're fighting the virus and uh, hopefully getting everyone vaccinated as they deserve. So um, also just a bit of housekeeping. If you have questions during this webinar process, you can put it in the Zoom or you can do it on Facebook, wherever you're watching it right now. Our staff will be uh, looking for questions and we'll be answering them at the end for our panelists as much as possible. So you can uh, use a Q&A function. You could um, comment on Facebook, whichever happens. I'll send a reminder when we go into uh, Q&A mode, but just so you know, if you have any questions up front, you can always put it in the chats. Um, so with that, I am going to, um, I'm going to be introducing our panel from uh, our wonderful guests, as I mentioned, we're going to have Lauren Carden from the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, Emily Hislop from P Project Sentinel, and David Lowe from Destination Home. So let's welcome them to the Zoom stage. Hello, thank you for having me, Assemblymember Lee, and thank you, Councilmember Carrasco, for the opening remarks. Um, my name is Lauren Carden. I'm a supervising attorney for the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley in our housing program. Um, we can go to the next slides. Yes. Um, so the Law Foundation, we're a nonprofit legal aid organization. We provide free legal advice and representation on housing issues to low-income tenants in Santa Clara County. And to access our services, you can call us on our phone intake line or fill out our online intake form. Perfect. So we're going to be discussing the eviction process tonight. So I wanted to give kind of a brief overview of that process before we dive into SB 91. So a landlord has to go through the eviction or unlawful detainer court process in order to legally remove a tenant from the property. So this process starts with a written notice. Um, today, we're going to be referring mostly to the 15 day written notice for non-payment of rent. But once this notice expires, the landlord can file the eviction lawsuit and serve that lawsuit on the tenant. The tenant then has the right to respond to the lawsuit and the court sets the case for trial. Um, that time period from the notice expiring to the trial date is about a month. And as a reminder, no lockout can occur until the trial is over and judgment has been entered for the landlord. And it's actually the sheriff that posts the notice to vacate and conducts the actual lockout. We definitely recommend seeking legal assistance. Oh, this is okay. <laughs> seeking legal assistance if you receive an eviction notice or if you're in the process. If you're in Santa Clara County, you can contact our office and Emily, our next presenter, will have resources for landlords to contact. So we're going to be talking about SB 91 today. Um, as background, AB 3088 actually created the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act, which provides protections against evictions. So that uh, bill took effect on August 31st, 2020, and it was going to expire on January 31st. Um, but SB 91 was passed before AB 3088 expired, and SB 91 extends the protections of the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act until June 30th, 2021. Um, so SB 91 also added a rental assistance program, which our next presenter, Emily, will be talking about in more detail. So I'm going to be focusing on just the eviction protections from SB 91. We can go to the next slide. So the COVID Tenant Relief Act in SB 91, it's not a complete moratorium on every eviction, but it does prevent certain eviction cases from moving forward at this time. So it does prohibit evictions based on non-payment of rent when a tenant did not pay because of a COVID-19 financial impact and the tenant returns a declaration that the landlord provides. Um, Eviction cases that are not based on non-payment of rent can go forward at this time. And in court in Santa Clara County, they're actually hearing these cases in person. Um, but when protected, a tenant can never be evicted for unpaid rent for the applicable COVID-19 time period. And the landlord instead has to go to small claims court to collect that debt. And that can start after August 1st. Um, for purposes of SB 90 rent, 91, rent does include rent plus any other financial charges. So that includes utilities. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, so SB91 is split into these two important time periods. So for the time period from March 1st to August 31st, rent that was due for that period can never be the basis of an eviction action if the tenant has submitted a declaration of financial hardship, which we're gonna look at that actual declaration in a bit. Um, and that declaration again is submitted after the landlord serves a notice to pay rent. Once that declaration is submitted, the debt becomes a civil debt, so can't be the basis for an eviction, but the landlord can sue in small claims court to collect that. Um, in Santa Clara County specifically, tenants had until February 28th to repay 50% of that debt, and then until August 31st to repay the remaining amount. And that time period is from our local Santa Clara County moratorium, which was in place before August 31st. Um, for the time period from the second column, so September 1st, 2020 uh, to June 30th, 2021, this is a little more complicated. The rent owed for this period can never be the basis of an eviction if the tenant submits the declaration of COVID financial distress in response to landlord's notice and pays 25% of the rent owed during that time period. So this 25% could be paid monthly or it can be paid in a lump sum on or before June 30th, 2021. And again, so if the tenant does those two steps, returns the declaration and pays 25% of the rent, then the landlord can't evict the tenant, but can sue in small claims court to collect that rent debt. And go to the next slide. Um, so under SB 91, a tenant doesn't automatically get the protections from the law, the tenant has to take an affirmative step to claim the protections. Um, for landlords, SB 91 um, requires them to now send a 15 day notice that used to be a three day notice for non-payment of rent, it's now 15 day notice. And landlords also have to include additional language in the notice and then a copy of the blank declaration. Um, but aside from this, a landlord can essentially move forward through the eviction process that we talked about a couple slides ago as normal, as long as they've changed this noticing. For tenants, um, when they receive the notice to pay rent, they again must prove that they've been impacted by COVID by signing that blank declaration provided to them and they're signing under penalty of perjury. And then they return that declaration to their landlord. Um, that declaration again must be returned within that 15 day period, which will be like in prominent letters on the top of the notice. Um, of what that period is. Um, another note, so the law, so SB 91, does state that landlords can't require tenants to provide additional proof of COVID impact. Um, the declaration is enough. The only exception is when a tenant is a high income tenant, which is defined as um, having income of 130% of the area median income. And we can go to the next slide. So this is um, an actual copy We'll kind of like cut, um, but it's a copy of the declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress, which is available on the state's um, housing is key website. Um, and you can actually find it in multiple languages there. So this declaration lists the um, circumstances that count as having a COVID-19 related financial distress. Um, those are loss of income, increased out-of-pocket expenses uh, related to performing essential work, increased expenses directly related to health impacts, um, child care or dependent care related to the pandemic that limited a tenant's ability to earn income, and then increased costs for child care or dependent adult care, and then also other circumstances that have reduced a tenant's income or increased their expenses. So again, a tenant can sign this and return it to their landlord after receiving it um, in the 15-day notice um, in order to claim the protections. And we can go to the next slide. So in returning the declaration, the 15-day notice should list um, how the declaration should be returned to the landlord. So tenants should definitely read through the whole notice to make sure that they are returning the declaration um, in the proper format. Um, I think the four common um, options are in person, by email, by mail, or through the same method as rent is paid but definitely look at the notice to make sure that it's being returned properly. We can go to the next slide. So this question comes up for our office a lot. So what if a tenant misses the 15 day deadline to turn in their declaration? 
So a tenant can still turn in the declaration late. Um, if the tenant misses the 15 day deadline though, the landlord can just move forward with the eviction lawsuit. Um, and then the tenant would have uh, to file the declaration within five court days of being served with that lawsuit. So this is the same time frame that a tenant has to answer or file a response to the eviction lawsuit. So kind of both documents could be filed at the same time. And once that declaration is filed in court, uh, the court actually has the duty to schedule a hearing to decide if the tenant had a good reason for not submitting the declaration within those 15 days from the notice. We can go to the next slide. Um, so SB 91, um, in addition to the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act also added some other protections for tenants. Um, the three on this slide are new, so they were not included in AB 3088. So under SB 91, the landlord cannot charge or try to collect late fees for COVID-19 rental debt if the tenant has provided the declaration. Landlord also cannot increase fees or charge for services that used to be free if the tenant has returned that declaration. And then the third one, a landlord cannot um, use the alleged COVID rental debt as a negative factor when looking at uh, rental applications for, pers for prospective tenants. Um, and landlord cannot refuse to rent to someone because they hold a COVID-19 rental debt. We can go to the next one. Oh, perfect. Okay, so these protections, uh, the just cause protections were actually from uh, AB 3088 um, and SB 91 extended this temporary protection, but currently uh, the just cause protections from the Tenant Protection Act are extended to all tenants until July 1st. So this just means that a landlord's notice to terminate the tenancy has to include a specific reason that the tenant's being terminated. So those reasons could be due to the tenant doing something bad, like not paying rent or creating a nuisance or having a lease violation, or it could be for no fault of the tenant, which is like owner move in or removal of the property from the rental market. Um, and for certain lease violations, um, the landlord does have to give time for the tenant to fix the issue before moving to eviction. And my last slide is next. Um, so before I pass it off to the next presenter, I just wanted to remind everyone that actually the CDC order on evictions is still in effect also. Um, this order puts a pause on eviction cases um, until the order expires, which is currently March 31st, though it could get extended. Um, like SB 91, it is a declaration-based protection. So there's a specific CDC declaration and it's available on our website and also the CDC website. Um, in general, our state protections under SB 91 are more protective, but um, there may be certain circumstances where the CDC order could help you if you're a tenant. Um, so definitely reach out for legal assistance if you think it might apply to your situation. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lauren. Now we'll now we will hear from Emily from Project Senso. Thank you, Assemblymember Lee, and thank you, Councilmember Carrasco, for inviting us to be on this panel um, and realize it's a lot of information. <laughs> um, for those of you who aren't aware, Project Sentinel is a nonprofit housing services agency. Um, we serve much of the South Bay. We do neutral tenant landlord counseling, education and dispute resolution. We also have a couple division, other divisions, uh, fair housing and education and complaint investigation as well as HUD certified housing counseling for first time home buyers, um, reverse mortgages, foreclosure, a uh, variety of mortgage issues. Uh, next slide. Um, so but Lauren had mentioned and also some of Lee about the uh, SB 91 setting up these rent relief programs. So these are funds that came from the federal government at the end of last year. Um, it's uh, before we get into the details because we're talking about two different counties. Um, I thought I'd go over who would qualify for these funds and what exactly is covered. 
So who qualifies for the rent relief assistance are impacted tenant households, meaning tenant households that have been financially impacted by COVID-19 as a reason for not being able to pay full rent. Um, those households which have incomes that are at or less than 80% of the area median income. And then Lauren had mentioned this earlier when we were discussing what high income tenants might be. And we understand that this is, doesn't always mean anything to most tenants. So I thought I'd discuss what area median income means and what these um, numbers at the bottom of the page represent. So the area median income is a government statistic that uh, tries to figure out the average um, income of, of people in different areas. So it's gonna be different based on county. Then they take that number and say, this is the medium, medium this is how much these, uh, this would be for a household of one, a household of two, a household of four. Um, so first, and when we talk about income, it's not just one person in the household, it's everybody who lives in that household, that apartment, that house, everybody's income altogether represents the household income. So what is 80% of the area median income for Santa Clara County? For a household of four, that currently means you earn, your total household income is less than $112,150. This is for um, calendar year 2020. Um, in Alameda County, it's slightly less. Um, so this, if you make, if your household makes under this amount, if you're a household of four, it's going to be a little higher. If you're, if you have more people in your household, going to be less. If it's less people in your household, and the state website that we will point to later, it has a way of looking this up, or you can call us to to help you figure it out. Um, so anybody at or below this amount, and with who's COVID impacted, would qualify for this this rent relief assistance. Um, it, the priority is going to be assisting households that are at or less than 50% AMI, but it, the people who are less than 80% AMI still stand in line. Um, it also prioritizes households where at least one person has been unemployed for the last 90 days before applying. Um, it's first going to go to cover back rent, um, that period of time that Lauren had discussed beginning of March of last year through March of this year. Um, and then subject to sending availability and if a tenant qualifies because they're still unable to pay current rent, they could apply to receive um, payments towards future rent like April, May, and June. Um, also any utility payment arrearages, so unpaid utility costs, that if there's still funding availability, a tenant could apply to receive that or other housing related expenses, but the priority is to back rent. So that's just a broad overview. Um, the next slide, please. So where is someone going to apply for these funds? Well, first of all, um, nothing's going to be available to accept applications until March 15th, which I realize is next Monday. Um, because of the way the funding works, the, the state got one chunk of funds, but then cities and counties that have a population larger than 200,000, they also got an additional chunk of funds. Um, and there were different ways that these, these cities and counties could choose to administer their funds. So um, what we have now is going to be two programs. Destination Home is going to talk about um, the county program um, that, that the county and city of San Jose are launching. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the state program. Both programs are available to everyone. There will be efforts to make that there's not double dipping but we wanted to under, people to understand the basics of them. So in uh, Assembly District 25, this includes Newark, which is going to fall under Alameda County's program um, and parts of Fremont. Now Fremont elected to do their own program. So we have information about that and that's gonna be a little different. Um, and then Milpitas, Santa Clara and parts of San Jose are uh, in Santa Clara County. Next slide. So for the state's program, which applicants can qualify for either one, um, this can be accessed by both landlords and low-income residents, meaning that landlords themselves can, if they know they have um, tenants that qualify, they can on their own apply and then the tenant would have to consent and provide um, necessary documents. Um, but the landlords can apply to receive a payment of 80% of that qualifying tenant's back rent 
from April of last year through March of this year, if they forgive the remaining 20% unpaid rent. Um, this is a great benefit to landlords who may not know how long it's going to take their tenants to repay. So this is a way they can get one payment of a large portion of that unpaid rent. Um, I just learned today with the state's implementer that a tenant can, if a tenant applies through the state program um, and puts in their landlord information, the landlord will be made aware of this 80% option. So the landlord doesn't have to be the one applying to, to do that 80% option. So if the landlord, for whatever reason, does not want to participate and would take that 80% um, option, the qualifying tenant can still apply to receive rent relief valued at 25% of the unpaid rent. Um, so we talked about back rent. This program, subject to funding availability, will also um, be available to follow qualifying tenants to apply to receive 25% of future rent if they're still having trouble making their payments. And this 25% would ensure the eviction protections that Lauren had talked about earlier. Um, though everybody is, is, who's 80% or under of AMI would qualify, the priority again is going to be the households that are less than 50%. And then Chad, uh, not Chad, excuse me, David Lowe from Destination Home is going to talk about the county's program, which is, is targeted for 30% or less, um, but they cover some more than this program. Next slide. So I realize all of this is very confusing. We are just learning the details. This that a program of this size, of funding of this size, and this kind of effort has never happened in our history. So we don't have all the specific information about where to apply, but we can tell you where to go to find out and to learn more as time as we move forward. So for the city of Fremont, they just announced today their own rental assistance program. So this is, um, tenants can apply to receive up to 12 months of back and forward rent, which would be um, paid directly to the landlord. And I believe it covers all of it, not just 80%, but all of it. This program is going to launch on April 1st. Um, this link here will take you to their flyer and you can fill out um, the form at the, the link fremont.gov forward slash rental assistance list to receive an email um, when the application is available. Um, residents of Newark, I am including Newark's uh, page where that information should be once, um, once they have information from the county about how the funds will be administered. Um, oh, we don't have, so uh, before on this slide, um, we, can, we can give it later. Um, Project Sentinel provides tenant landlord counseling and mediation services on behalf of the city of Fremont to for free to landlords and tenants in Fremont. Um, lit, if you go to our website, housing.org or the number that's on the site, you can talk to our Fremont kids manager. Um, for, to get tenant landlord counseling or mediation services in Newark, you would contact Echo Housing and their number is right there. Next slide. So that was an overview of the rent relief system, um, uh, rental rent relief assistance programs. I wanted to point out some other additional resources that might be available to constituents. Um, Milpitas has, we have tenant and landlord counseling and mediation services. Milpitas also has a rent relief program that does not require being COVID impacted. So we put the link to that program. So some people are unable to pay rent, but it may have nothing to do with COVID. Also Project Sentinel together with the city of Milpitas uh, launched a pilot program, which we call the village approach um, using our mortgage services and our landlord tenant counseling and some grant money. Um, we try to work with uh, COVID impacted tenants of small landlords who may be struggling to make their mortgage payments to find a multi-pronged solution that could involve working with their lender for modification, a small grant money to um, cover some of the back rent. So if you are a COVID impacted tenant of a small landlord, just in a smaller building, um, and, and you think the landlord's struggling, please, or if you're a struggling landlord, please contact us. And this is for the city of Milpitas because you might get uh, some unique service available to you. Um, city of Santa Clara, this is the number for our Santa Clara case manager for tenant and landlord counseling and mediation. And for all areas, um, our HUD, 
housing counseling mortgage um, uh, counselors are available. And AB 3088, the first state law, set forth um, some relief for what are called small landlords. That would be a landlord that has four or fewer buildings with four or fewer units each. Um, so they're entitled to some forbearance provisions, but we may be able to coach landlords on how to work with their lenders to either extend the forbearance period or possible mortgage modification. Next slide, please. I think that was it. So this is the website that we've all mentioned. And um, over the weekend, the COVID rent relief button <laughs> became active. And this is where um, tenants and landlords can find what organizations, how they can apply. They can apply online. There's a lot of really good information on this website. The declaration that Lauren mentioned um, is found here in multiple languages. Um, there's the AMI calculator uh, that will take you to the document um, so you can figure out if you're within the threshold. And also under publications, there's a really handy uh, landlord tenant uh, rights and responsibilities guide, which was updated recently. And just to questions about security deposits or other rental issues, you might be able to find the answer there or to contact us. And um, so I'm gonna pass it. So this is what happens right now when you click on the COVID 19 rent relief button, as you can see, so there's application coming soon, but this is supposed to go live on Monday. So, <laughs> um, but this will give you information about what kind of information you might need to provide in that application and documentation. So I'm gonna pass it over to Chad to talk about uh, the city of San Jose and County of Santa Clara's rent relief program. Thank you so much, Emily. Now we'll, we'll go over to David Lowe from the Destination Home. Great. Thank you, Assemblymember Lee, and, and thank you, Councilmember Carrasco, for your comments earlier. Uh, hey everybody, David Lowe, I'm with Destination Home. We're a public-private partnership that's working to end homelessness here in Santa Clara County. And so for the past three and a half years, we've been helping administer a homelessness prevention system, which is a program that helps provide rental assistance and other support to families, individuals who may be at the brink of losing their housing and ending up homeless. And so really we've been very active for the past 12 months of trying to ramp up that system because we know there are a lot more people struggling since the pandemic started. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the approaches we're taking here and another opportunity for rent assistance that'll be available in the weeks ahead. So you already heard from Emily did a great job talking about the statewide program, which is gonna be a great resource for a lot of folks. Uh, but one thing that we've been doing here at Destination Home is working with our partners at the County of Santa Clara, City of San Jose, Sacred Heart Community Service to figure out how we wanna deploy some additional funding that the city and county are getting directly. And um, what we decided uh, collectively as we worked on this is that we really want to deploy what we're calling a hybrid approach here in Santa Clara County. And what it really means is we're gonna have a couple of programs working side by side to meet the need in our community. So the first one is the state program you already heard it from Emily about, which would be a great resource, particularly for landlords to apply directly and other low income tenants to be able to get the assistance they need. But what we're going to do at Destination Home, and this is through the homelessness prevention system, is run a parallel program that's really focused on the needs of our lowest income residents. And this is something that we've seen has been really important since the pandemic started. There's a lot of need out there, but it's the people who are making very little or nothing right now who are struggling the most, suffering the greatest impacts. And for those folks, we need to take a little bit different approach to make sure they get the assistance they need. You know, there are a lot of people here who do are not as digitally literate and so can have trouble with an online portal, people who aren't in traditional land or lease situations and so may have other qualification issues or just have a harder time connecting to the system. And so that's why we wanted to run this parallel program, which I'm going to talk in a second about, alongside the statewide program so other people at that lowest income bracket have another way of getting help. And what you see there on the screen is just an excerpt from a recent report from the city of San Jose, where they're discussing this issue and really saying, we know who really is in the worst bind of Mons, these extremely low income residents, people were merely making anything and we need to make sure that we are having a venue to get them the help they need and that they can be part of this recovery. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what the plans are for that. And you know, with the caveat too, that we are still developing this, utilizing federal funding is very complicated and we wanna make sure it's rolled out correctly. But what we're gonna do is um, through this homelessness prevention system, deploy um, another tens of millions of dollars in rental assistance um, to go side by side with the state program. And our local program is gonna really focus on the lowest income folks. And these are people who fall in the extremely low income category or people who make less than 30% of the average income that Emily described before. For reference, that's about 47,000 um, for a family of four. 
Um, with this program, we're going to make sure that the payment and assistance we're, assistance we're able to provide won't penalize someone if they don't have a landlord who's not cooperative or who they can't get in touch with. Uh, a big focus on making sure our processes are simplified and that we're removing barriers for people to access this funding. And in addition, because we as a, a nonprofit organization have been fundraising some um, for COVID relief, we'll have some other private dollars we can supplement with this to make sure we're solving problems for people who are may not be eligible because of a technicality or may need a different kind of help. And so most importantly, how to get this assistance, you know, we are going to leverage the existing homelessness prevention system. We have 15 um, permanent partners who we work with um, all the way up from Mountain View down to Gilroy. And since the pandemic started, we've added another several dozen partners to help us help people get the word out, help people fill out applications and provide assistance. And so we'll have several dozens of partners out here. We're spreading the word as well as being able to help people apply for those funds. And so all this, we're working very fiercely to get it up and running. We're still a couple of weeks away. We're going to be going back to the city and county for the contract approval in two weeks, and we hope to be launched pretty soon afterwards. We want to make sure people knew that there's going to be another option for these extremely low-income households for where they can get assistance in the weeks ahead. Great. Thank you so much to all our panelists on here for having a really deep in-depth look at SB 91 and the resources and how to access them. Um, we're getting a lot of good questions in the uh, in the Q&A function right now. So I just want to remind folks that uh, whether you're watching on Facebook Live or if you're in the Zoom, submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom, which should be at the bottom of your screen. So if you go to the, the little button that says Q&A, we're getting a bunch of questions coming in now. Uh, we're going to go through some of these questions. And certainly, uh, if your question is not answer today does not mean that you cannot contact us and we'll get you more answers as you go. I am noticing there are some very case specific questions, so it might be better worked out um, um, with these organizations or with our offices. Um, I, you know, I, I definitely encourage you all to, to reach out to us, especially if you have specific cases and things that are ongoing. Um, I don't know the level of co uh, comfortability with some people if I air out your complete situation online, but I am grateful some people are sharing it. Uh, so how we're going to do this is that uh, I will be taking questions that are going to come up through live through a Q&A function and Council Member Carrasco is going to be taking some of the questions that um, were pre-submitted. So when you RSVP via Zoom, uh, although I will address really quickly, one question that we get, did get was, are we going to get the slides after this? And the question is, uh, the answer is yes. So all the folks who RSVP here uh, via Zoom, uh, we will have the presentation emailed to you after this. So you will have all the contact information on there, all the call, uh, all the phone numbers, all the things on there. Uh, if we go back to that slide, uh, there we go. You'll have all the contact information on there and all the things uh, to contact folks with. Um, so how about I'll kick it off with one of the questions we got in the Q&A and I see more of them are coming in. Um, and then we'll go to Councilmember Carrasco and she'll ask one of the uh, questions I pre-submitted. I think this is a good question is that um, do you recommend that all tenants thinking they may need financial support but are not sure just fill out the declaration just in case they will need them in the future um, and this goes for anyone in our panel who feels best uh, to answer this um i'll clarify one thing so the declaration the COVID 19 declaration of financial distress so you fill that out if you've had a COVID related financial impact, that's not, um, that form is not directly related to whether you'll be able to get the financial assistance. It's kind of like two separate forms you may have to fill out in order to get the protections and then the rental assistance. And if you wanted to access the rental assistance, where would you go for that one? I could answer that too, I've learned yeah. now. Um, so you can go to the state website if you make 80% um, of the area med median income or more, or you can contact a local partner through the homeless prevention system, uh, which is most of the emergency assistance network agencies. Great, thank you. Do any of our other partners wanna chime in on that or move on to the next question? Okay. All right, all right, Councilmember Carrasco. You got our next one. You, which which one was the question that you wanted to ask? Go ahead. <clears throat> um, how about this? I'll I'll fish out another one on our Q and A while we're figuring this out. Um, so this is, I think, also uh, 
there's a lot of good questions. There's a lot more coming in after I ask it, which is awesome. Um, so this is a good one. This one comes from Wade. Um, what assistance is available to landlords who have tenants with past rent, past due rent balances? In my case, my tenants moved out in November 2020, owing over $24,000 in past uh, due rent, and then declared bankruptcy. According to their attorney, I'm prohibited from even contact them, contacting them regarding any past due amounts due to the bankruptcy. So what, um, what avenues would, would uh, Wade have? Um, my understanding is that the rent relief is for tenants who are currently residing. Um, just because I know a little bit about bankruptcy law, uh, Wade should absolutely file a proof of claim with the, the bankruptcy court. Um, that's how they would go through the legal system, how they would pursue um, unpaid debt. Because when somebody declares bankruptcy, everything has to go through the bankruptcy court. But if you're having any issues with mortgage, if that's um, you would you may qualify if you qualify as a small landlord, you might be able to get some some mortgage relief um, if you want to call our number and see if uh, that might work in your situation. Does anyone else uh, want to chime in on that one? No, no. Checking your heads works too, because I'll just check the, the, the video feed. All right, this is a good clarifying question, I think. Uh, Innerdeep asks, if the landlord resides in San Jose and a tenant is in Milpitas, should they apply to separate programs? So is the, is the program based on the tenancy of, of the residency of the tenant or the residency of the landlord? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. I mean, so for the most part, programs are basically usually based on where the tenant is, but I will say at least for the destination home program, we're a countywide program. So whether you live in Milpitas, Cupertino, or Gilroy, that's something we can serve um, across the across the spectrum, as is the state program obviously is much wider. So fortunately in these situations that we have some flexibility for where folks can apply. Yeah, in Santa Clara County, um, the city and county work together, so it's not going to make a difference where you are. Um, Alameda might be a little bit different. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Julie. If a tenant has not paid at least 50% of, of uh, the rent debt for the protected period, can the landlord pursue a financial judgment as of March 1st in small claims court? So my understanding is the landlord would have to wait until August 1st of 2021 to bring, even though the rent was due in Santa Clara, sorry, the rent was due on February 28th. Um, I still believe that lawsuit can't be filed until August 1st. And Emily is, is nodding. So I feel like I feel confident in that answer now. That's the court's understanding. So I think that that's right. Good. Uh, here's another good clarifying question. And I think it's good that folks are asking very engaged in depth questions. And of course, again, just letting everyone know all the organizations on here are, help, are here to walk you through the process. It is very complicated and it is very uh, confusing. So you don't feel like you're confused. And that's, I mean, don't feel like you shouldn't be confused. It's very valid. Um, so here's a good question. Can landlords apply for rent assistance if the tenant has already vacated uh, when the application is submitted? That one just came in. So I think that's similar to the, the question before. And I, my understanding is the point of rent relief funds is to keep tenants housed. So if they've already left, um, that these programs are not gonna be available. Mm -hmm. Okay, good clarifying. Uh, and anybody can correct uh, me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yes. So I can't speak to the state program, but I do know for our program in San Clara County, the homeless prevention system, we, we actually work with a tenant. So a tenant can seek assistance even if they've moved houses, but I know that, or homes, but I know that's a little different than the landlord situation. Great. Um, Jay, you and ask, and I can answer this really quickly. Uh, is this only for residential housing and not business tenants? That's correct. This program is only for residential tenancy. Uh, for commercial tenancy, the governor just enacted an executive order that also extends it or does a similar pause to it. Uh, we will be sending out more information about that too. And we just, cause that just came, I think uh, Friday or Thursday. Um, that's also a similar pause on, on commercial evictions. And we did um, two weeks ago, 
pass also uh, economic stimulus directly to small business too. So if you're concerned about that, that is also part of it. And um, the county too has a commercial eviction moratorium that's still uh, in place. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's good. No, it's it's good to definitely good to know. But in case uh, you're a resident in a county that doesn't have that, okay. um, yes. Did I? Uh, this is from Anthony. Can a tenant be evicted if they break the contract? Uh, but I assume not for simply not paying. Yes, so if there was a different lease violation um, other than non-payment of rent, um, even if the tenant had a COVID impact, um, that eviction could go forward because um, a lease violation is considered a valid just cause reason for an eviction. Um, I should also say this is in Santa Clara County. I believe Alameda County has um, stronger protections for tenants. I don't think any, very few cases are going forward in Alameda County right now. Absolutely. All right, uh, Council Member Carrasco, you've got some pre-submitted questions for us. Let's- Yeah, well, away. a lot, thank you, uh, Assembly Member. And so along with that eviction question, there is someone, John from San Jose, who's asking, is the landlord still able to evict during the pandemic? And if so, how many days do they allow you to have to move out? So that is dependent on kind of the type of housing and also the just cause reason. Um, so it could vary. I mean, it can be like three days to 90 days. And so could you, could you add just a little um, more clarification on, uh, on the variance? What, what would be the difference between those um, three days and 90 days? Yeah, so some, um, if a tenant lives in subsidized housing, it's usually a longer, um, or those programs have specific rules about the length of the notice. Um, if it's a, I'm just speaking in very general terms, so usually if it's a no fault reason, so like owner move in, like the tenant didn't do anything bad, the owner just wants to move into the unit or um, is taking the unit off the rental market, that will usually require a 60 day notice. Um, similarly, if a tenant has lived in a unit for longer than a year, they're required to get 60 day notice for termination. Um, if there's an extreme nuisance issue, that could be a three day notice. Um, so it does depend on kind of what the alleged or the reason for the termination and then type of housing and length of time. So there's a lot of factors that could go into what type of notice is needed. What kind, of what kind of grant money? Council Member Carrasco, I think we lost your signal there for a second. Um, are you still with us? Technical difficulties for it. Um, I'm just gonna address, uh, we have a, a lot of questions I'm sensing some themes about, um, just wanna reiterate. Um, so Lynn just asked that if a landlord accepts 80% of unpaid rent, who is responsible to apply for that fund? The landlord or tenant? In that case, it would be the landlord. Oh, or Emily, do you wanna also elaborate on that point there? So I learned, so it, Landlords can apply and then mm -hmm. the tenants would cooperate. And, but I've learned today that the tenant can apply and the, the landlord will be notified of that option. So the tenant can basically show the landlord, I qualify, you know, here's this, this option, but the landlords are required to provide certain information like that they own the unit and um, tax ID, I believe. Mm -hmm. And just want to reiterate, you know, all the grant fund or all the money in this program goes direct to landlord, whether it be the tenant or the landlord. So either your tenant or your landlord, all the money goes directly to the landlord to pay for the unpaid back rent. Um, so highly, highly encouraged landlords or your landlord to be applying in the program. Uh, and you don't, um, yes, and the landlord, landlord hopefully will be the one applying for it. Because I think I'm sensing a lot of uh, similar themes in a lot of these questions, a lot of good scenarios we're, we're picking up. Uh, but I think that that's one of the highlights of this is to certainly apply for it, especially as your if you're a landlord, you can recoup eighty percent, eighty percent of your unpaid uh, unpaid rent. Mm -hmm. um, Magdalena, do are you back on the line with us? I hope so. Can you hear oh, me? There you are. Yes, yes. Here I am. 
Uh, so Barry from Fremont is asking what uh, grant money is available for commercial and residential landlords? Uh, if the property is in Fremont, there's the Fremont rent relief for uh, residential landlords. Um, I believe Assembly Member Lee talked about some state stimulus, small um, business relief, um, but you may check the county's website too. They may have enacted some programs. Alameda County. And do, and do, you, uh, do you have any um, information whether uh, Alameda County, Fremont, uh, Santa Clara County has different programs. Yes, so um, with respect to residential tenancies, Fremont chose because it's a city larger than 200,000 to uh, administer their own rent relief program and it covers um, the full amount of rent for tenants who qualify, paid directly to the landlord up to 12 months. Um, and in if it's a landlord in Santa Clara County, you can apply for the, the residential rent relief from the state program, which I believe also you can do as, as a landlord in Alameda County too. Thank you. Um, and uh, Karen from San Jose is asking the question, will undocumented families be able to receive rental assistance? Sure, and from our Santa Clara Homeless Prevention System, absolutely, you know, we do not ask about um, undocumented status and that won't be a barrier. And I, Emily, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is also the case for the state program. Um, I believe so, but there's other organizations that um, Catholic Charities, I think, that, that uh, are, don't have those um, funding restrictions. Thank you for that. Uh, I think Yes, thank you. I think there's a similar question that we had come in, um, similar to that one. So obviously the program is AMI based, area median income based, based on your income. So is there any restriction to documentation to prove your income? Say, what if people are paid by cash? I think, uh, I think um, one of the big concerns is uh, for people who, of course, are, are um, having to prove their immigration status and uh, and of course, my office is getting a lot of those questions and, uh, and people who, who are living in the shadows of, of our uh, society are always very concerned about whether or not they can apply, whether or not they're going to qualify, whether or not I, ICE is going to be involved in one way or the other, or the information is going to be shared. Can you provide some sort of reassurance? Yeah, absolutely. For the for the Santa Clara County Homelessness Prevention System, where we do not ask about documented status, excuse me, we do not ask about um, your undocumented status or for any documentation related to that. And particularly when it comes to proving income, we do know there are a lot of people who are paid in cash or may not have traditional forms. So we are flexible. There are other ways that we can get a self-certification or alternate forms for documenting that income loss. So um, I don't know if you want to add anything for how the state programs operate, but at least those who are coming through the homelessness prevention system, we try to assuage those concerns as much as we can. Um, I don't have all the details of the state program. I do know that uh, Fremont had a pretty, for their program, has a pretty detailed, like if you're a gig worker, like what types of things, um, they try to give a lot of options for how people might show their income. Thank you. And, and again, uh, no cooperation with ICE. That's, I believe, prohibited by state law. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Assembly Member. Of course, and thank you, uh, Council Member, for highlighting that concern. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of consternation amongst our communities, immigrant communities, but luckily this is a state program, uh, so we don't have to dot too many eyes with the federal government. So at least there's not even that, that hint of it. Um, this is an interesting question because we did talk about utilities. Utilities is factored into this. Um, and this is this was actually an issue area we brought up in the legislature talking about how does the utilities piece actually work and we had to have some debate about this too but um we have a question from uh, reverend deacon kathleen crow would very high utilities qualify as a COVID impact for seniors on fixed income would that qualify as a COVID impact i had seen that question and mm -hmm. and i think <laughs> I think this person may, um, 
benefit from seeking some legal advice because there is the, on the COVID-19 um, financial distress declaration, there is that number six, which is other, um, like other instances that caused a decrease in income or increase in expenses. And so if somehow the increase in utilities is related to the COVID um, pandemic that could potentially, um, that person could still potentially be qualified under, under the declaration, but it's probably best to seek some legal assistance um, if you're unsure. Does anyone else uh, want to chime in on that one? Just making sure. Okay, cool. Uh, Magdalena, do you have uh, any of the other pre submitted questions for us? Okay, we might um, be having some internet issues again, but just to remind folks, um, still taking questions. There's still no, a lot coming the in. Other Questions that okay. have already been answered. Thank oh, okay. you. Good. Thank you. So we're still getting a bunch of questions coming in uh, and we're gonna try to answer them as much as possible. But again, wanted to clarify that after this, we will be sending uh, the slides and everything on here. All the, all the uh, phone numbers and email contacts will be on here. And if you're still confused after that, that's okay. We're here to help you walk, walk through it. Uh, call our offices, we'll help you walk through the situation. Um, so that will be important. Um, Trying to not do one that's too issue very specific. Again, um, want to want to emphasize that if you have very specific situation, especially ongoing one, definitely uh, seek us out for help. Um, can you clarify on the tenant? This is a question that's coming in from Link. Can you clarify on the tenant income requirement? Is that based on pre-COVID annual income during the period of owed rent or current income? So, what what income documentations are needed for these applications? So again, it's about, uh, is it pre-COVID in income or is it during COVID income? In my understanding, it's based on calendar 2020, but maybe David, Lowe, you could correct me. Yeah, you know, I'm not 100% sure about the state program, but I think that does sound correct. Um, I do know for our local program, we're going to be looking at what your income is now, because we know a lot of people's situation has changed. Good. Okay, uh, three... So, sorry, it's just hard to read when there's a lot of questions coming through. I'm just scrolling through them. Um, so just wanna also reiterate definitely, um, definitely that you should all contact our office if you have issues coming. I still see more that are like very specific. Um, I can answer one that was yeah, kind sure. of general, um, or I just wanna address this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if a landlord doesn't, um, is the question was, what if a tenant applies for the 80% assistant that the landlord doesn't approve? Is the landlord required to comply in this case? So they're not required to comply, but this will severely limit what they could try to collect through a court action. So the part of SB 91 um, added some pretty specific requirements that landlords have to prove that they cooperated with if the tenant, they have to first say if the tenant would have qualified for rent for rent relief that they cooperated or that they tried to apply on behalf of the tenant. So if they don't elect to, uh, to take any of the rent relief, they're not, going, they're not gonna be able to collect the full amount um, through a court action. All right, well, let's do, uh, if there's any last questions, please submit them in the Q&A function or on Facebook if you're watching that one. Um, but again, definitely want to iterate that people should contact us. Um, another thing I definitely, I've seen a theme about the split and uh, perhaps in fairness, they're pointing out about the 80%, 20% split. And I understand there's people who are frustrated that's only 80%. Look, if I had my way in the negotiations, it would have been a hundred percent when everyone who applies gets a hundred percent of their rent, uh, Rent debt paid back, but apparently some folks did not agree with that in the legislature. Uh, but your member is similar me right here. I agreed, I want to do 100%, but they did not agree with the full amount. So this is a program that's still going to be evolving and we're going to be monitoring the state legislature. As money starts going out this month, we will be doing monthly monitoring checks, basically a metricing of how the program is. And by no means is the conversation about rent debt in California 
whether it's owed by a tenant or or you need it as a landlord, is not over because the moratorium expires in June. Hopefully the pandemic will be over by June, but this is something we're still committed to working on and it's still gonna be an ongoing conversation. So definitely uh, appreciate everyone's engagement on this. Uh, there's one more question. I think this was a good one. Um, if I'm a tenant, do I need to wait to get the rental assistance before I move? I'm planning to move within this month. I filed out the declaration form, but the landlord wants me to get the assistance. So do they have to wait before they move? I could maybe summarize what both David and Emily had said before was the tenant could technically get assistance, you know, at the new unit, but if the tenant moves from the current unit, that rental, the landlord couldn't get that rental debt paid off by the state program. I, I think it's right? an issue that needs to be addressed because, okay. um, I mean, that there's an, I would think that there's an interest in trying to help landlords make whole and maybe a tenant's leaving for some other reason that they shouldn't be punished. Um, but I, maybe the county and state, um, I mean, sorry, the county city have some guidelines. There is a lot to digest around these programs. Um, and, you know, even with this panel of, I have some very intelligent, knowledgeable people here. We, we haven't digested all of it, particularly um, these questions, but they are good questions um, and relevant. I think uh, it's a little more clear cut when the tenant already moved a long time ago, but if an application is pending, there may be um, an answer related to when the application was filed. So it's answering without answering, sorry. <laughs> Right. I'll just clarify again, for our homelessness prevention system, that would not be an issue, but we're still all waiting for more information on how the state program will work. And hopefully by the time that rolls out next week, uh, we'll have a better answer to that question. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. And it highlights the point that this um, this, was a, this was a bill proposal that was baked quite hurriedly because of the urgency of the issue. So there's still a lot to figure out in implementation. We should hopefully start by next week and we'll see how it works out. But having your feedback is way really important. Um, it's 6.32, so I want to respect the time of our speakers. Uh, are there any closing remarks you all want to make really quickly? And then I'll also invite Councilmember Crossco to close. But are there any closing thoughts you have for all our audience? I'll just say thank you for, for hosting us. And thank you, Councilmember. You know, we're, we really appreciate the support. And for all those who had these very detailed questions, I know there'll be a lot more details coming out. So I urge you to stay connected to, to the resources the state will be publishing in at Destination Home. We certainly will for our program in, in the next couple of weeks. Emily, Lauren, just want to um, offer it to you if you, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll just point out, so our, our website lawfoundation.org also has a lot of resources on SB 91, because um, I know this was like a very quick um, overview, but if you want to digest anything further, you can look at our website. Um, also just thank you, Assemblymember Lee, for having us here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us and I'll just remind, I believe we serve most of your, your district um, or can at least point them to resources who can help, but we can always just give people information if they, about their specific questions. Um, we're, everything's neutral, free and confidential. So if you call the 800 number that's on the first slide, you, you should be able to punch in where you live and get connected with the right person. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco, any final thoughts for everyone on the call? Thank you so much. As, as you can see, uh, you know, even when there is uh, some support, it's still a, a complicated issue and it's complicated for both, both the tenant and the landlord. And, uh, and, and, and my hope is that at least in this last hour, <clears throat> Uh, there's been some clarification over a very complicated issue and there, the phone numbers and the resources are right up there on, on the screen. And for those who still have questions, please, please make sure that uh, you use those numbers that are right there on your screen and, and you reach out to folks who, uh, who can truly help you and support you. Uh, uh, again, this, is a, this has been such a difficult time for everybody. 
uh, reach out, get the support and get the resources that you need. Make sure that uh, you don't leave without getting your, your questions uh, resolved. But more importantly, know that we're all in this together. We really are. Uh, our job is not to bankrupt landlords. It's not to, uh, to leave you without answers. It really is to support everyone that needs help at this very difficult time. And my team is, is on here as well. Uh, please reach out to us. I know that assembly member Lee is, uh, is uh, uh, having his team as well, working very hard to make sure that all of his residents are also taken care of. Uh, and his residents are not just the ones that are, are here in the Bay Area, but it's every Californian. Uh, so it's really important to make sure that your representative is, uh, is uh, doing all that they can for you. So uh, thank you, assembly member Lee, for including me in this town hall. It's one of the most important issues uh, of our time during COVID, making sure that people are safe and they're housed and their families uh, remain uh, in, in a safe environment. So thank you again. And thank you all, by the way, for, for being here at, at the town hall, making sure that everybody gets the information that they need. Yeah, well, thank you so much, council member. Thank you to our special guests uh, who are gonna be great at navigating through this, uh, this period and getting you the relief that you need. So please do call those uh, phone numbers on your screen. Um, just closing thoughts on my end is, yes, we are going to send you the slides at the very end of this so you have all the resources at your disposal. It is a complicated topic, just as council member talked about, and, uh, you know, definitely you don't want to get it wrong, as one person talked about. Uh, there's a lot of great resources out there for you to contact. If you're having trouble accessing them in the coming weeks, definitely feel free to reach out. Uh, but I also want to address that some people did bring up uh, the question of our, our, homeowner, our homeowners, you know, who aren't or just homeowners, uh, and rent and commercial leaser is going to be addressed. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is slightly different from the topic, but that is happening right now. We are still in fierce negotiations right now. Uh, the governor wants certain things one way, the Senate and the assembly want things certain one way. So we're still trying to figure it out right now, but it's definitely making sure all parties come to the table, especially when it comes to land, um, sorry, property owners. Uh, if you're on the call listening about this, we're trying to get the banks on side right now because those are the people that hold your mortgages. For the commercial things, we're trying to talk about the big commercial landlords who have a lot of money and have the means to defer rent on folks. So these are all conversations. They're difficult ones having to say capital, but I want to assure you that they're happening right now. You might not see them in the news all the time, unfortunately, but they are happening right now. And it's our commitment, as well, that's my commitment, especially to, to be working, especially on this rental issue right now and making sure that it works in the coming months. And hopefully it can be a model of relief for our small businesses and our homeowners who are struggling through the pandemic uh, because we want to make sure this works for everyone. And having you all, your feedback as this process goes is going to be really, really super important. So again, want to thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Hope everyone stay safe. Please, please reach out if you have questions and uh, take care of one. So thank you so much, everyone. All right, bye-bye.